has moved up a notch. What was 5.86 seconds is now nine seconds. Yeah. He's in the 150s. Chasing pack is in the 152s. The next uh, car along, the uh, I think, lost a little bit of time on that lap, probably with traffic. That is a change again. That is Julian Anslauer going by the JMW car. Or did he? Not quite, because on the fight back, or, or on back. The, at the exit of the corner, the 66 just stays ahead of car 77. So Julian Anlauer looking for a way by again. He's right underneath John Lancaster, and Lancaster needing to be cautious to allow Anlauer the racing room and not force him into the pit wall. I think both cars right over the kerb, as I was describing they were doing last night. And now in the dust, Anlauer to the inside line, heading uphill through turns two and three. And did Anlauer get through the corner there? Yeah, but the Ferrari still got ahead. Brilliant I'm, racing. I'm not quite sure how they changed positions from the inside and outside there. there was no room John Lancaster went into that turn on the outside and came through the turn on the inside <laughs> I've no idea how that happened well in that gap of darkness who knows what might happen but uh, that's the beauty of Motorland Aragon in not quite the middle of the night but we are just after half past nine in the evening it's terrific a... driving from both John Lancaster in that Ferrari and Julian Anlauer who we know all about after his antics both in the United States but also I remember him first arriving at the 24 hours of Le Mans and really surprising many people John Lancaster's been out of the game for a little while certainly within ACO rules racing been doing quite a lot of testing John Ah, uh, but he goes off. off the track now, and is that a legacy of running a touch wide and out into the marbles? Because all of a sudden, when he wasn't in, under as much pressure from Julian Anlauer, he ran deep into turn 12, did just about get the car back to the actual track, though, and stays ahead. Uh, 34 car, by the way, back out on track, but way, way down 22nd place. Racing Team Turkey. Martin Rump now has a brilliant view of this battle. So it's, just. it's for the podium and third, fourth and fifth right together oh. as Anlauer now charging his way down the inside on the brakes. And I think Rump might look into this as well because Lancaster can't pull back across the nose of the second Porsche. Oh, can he? No, he can. He slots between the two Proton cars. He's just going to come out on the top here. And round the outside, and Nine Dames going back into second position here. Can they? Can they? Oh, no, they're going to lose third. It was side-to-side -side contact, side-to-side -side contact with the absolute racing, and then the 60 goes by. So from second to third for the 83, from fifth to fourth for the 60, and that was all with the Rinaldi racing car trying to defend from... Rahel Fry into the chicane, goes to the outside this time. Don't have any recon fences to go here as well. Over the curves for Veroni, either side from the Ilix cars. Go on, Rahel. It's five wide. Fry <laughs> round the outside. <laughs> Fabulous manoeuvre. And recon's was. going there too. She's saying to Veroni, if you're going to hang around, I'm going to drive through the gravel and around you. Regon going oh the same way as well. And the Porsche out in the background losing time because muscling his way up the inside is Frederick Scharndorf for Kessel Racing. This is a 20-minute GT race that has suddenly broken down in the middle of a four-hour encounter. Absolutely amazing. And back through it into the second Ferrari, position. Even if there was contact, the lose came before the contact. But you might be right. It's difficult to tell from that angle whether those two cars... Uh, collected each other but here comes the change then in GTE because right to uh, up the inside of Marco of uh, Rob Smith goes Marco Seafried into Ralph corner leaving it late on the brakes and the 77 Porsche can just about Rob's no, not done. Still Rob's not there. done Rob Smith on the inside now of Pirelli corner we've got a uh, Panis Bartes competition car right behind that's the LMP3 car number 16 driven by Eric Debar and he's trying his best not to get involved in this GTE battle, but he'd dearly like to be ahead of the Porsche and Ferrari. Settle Euro International and M Racing YMR. A little bit he's of tactics at play. Coming. No, he's not. He's <laughs> <at> the wrong <laughs> side. He might have him no, he has. On the inside, Miguel Molina. Can Cairoli pull across the road? There's contact, I think, and Cairoli is elbowed off. out. He's off. Almost to make the point that there was contact. Cairoli shortcuts turn seven, and I don't think he's going to be able to cut through. Oh, he stayed in front. 
Ireland. Unbelievable stuff. Matteo Cairoli off the road. I cannot believe he's going to be allowed to keep this, but still, tucked underneath the rear wing is Miguel Molina. And this time around, despite the Porsche running off the road at seven, he has made the move stick. That was better speed being carried through turn seven. And Molina, the Spaniard, now leads the way. It's not over yet, though, because Cairoli has got his down He's off track again. Has the 66 ever been in front, by the way, in the uh, GTE battle? This might be the first oh. lap it leads of the whole race. Unbelievable. It's still traffic, including another GTE car. They, th they come through. JMW on the inside. This time, I think it's done. Porsche can't get through the traffic. And the 66 and being uh, just that bit further ahead. Cairoli's trying anything now. Cairoli is very, very angry indeed. He ran off the road at 7. He's off the road at 11 as well to gain some of the speed back again. Well, the question marks are going to be about the Porsche and the track limits for the 88 because the Ferrari's lines have been exemplary for this final tour. And I think, I have to check the lap charts, but the only lap that this Ferrari has led in the whole race is the winning lap and there is Liam Griffin who is, is catching but not very quickly catching Rhoda but uh, not very quickly catching the two guys ahead of him but it's, we're going to have I think a five car battle uh, pretty soon in GTE Quick glance down the order tells me that Dario Capitanio in that all Norma battle has managed to get by Jan Erlesche and here comes Ross Gunn to try and draw alongside the Porsche of Sean Camathius. Now Ross Gunn can break later surely and Brilliant. he goes right round the outside. That's classic Kemmel straight into Lacombe but the Aston's wide through the second element of the right left and right flick so Joel Camathius fancies his chances of getting the place back again. Careful boys, there's almost a little bit of contact as they run down towards Bruxelles and Camathius up the inside at Bruxelles means that Ross Gunn can't turn in where he wants to and the Porsche's back in front. Brilliant stuff. Pure GT racing. What a joy it is to watch these cars duke it out. And Joel Camathias, experienced GT racer. Ross Gunn, very much a coming man in the Aston Martin family. And uh, I expect to see him back and part of this for next season as well. Great stuff. Ross Gunn, I mean, a terrific manoeuvre at the end of the Kemmel straight, but it was always going to be touch and go as to whether he could stop the car in time. It, it just ran wide a little bit out of the first right-hander, and that was all Joel Camathias needed. Nice bit of uh, just running a bit too deep into the Bruxelles hairpin, which meant that Ross couldn't turn in and get to the apex and uh, back past again, but that Porsche is ill-handling for me. It is, and I think that's what caused the opportunity, or offered the opportunity for Ross Gunn in the first place. I think if we stuck with this battle up through uh, Rouge and Radion, you'd see that he's struggling with ultimate grip and the track he needs to fire the car down the Kemmel straight. So Ross got the opportunity to get a much better uh, exit speed from Radion. That, that, that uh, move started at the top of Radion. Yeah. And uh, that's often how things happen around here at Spa. You need to be thinking several corners in front. Again, the Porsche cannot get to the apex into the bus stop chicane. Better through the second bit of that corner. Ray out wide onto the curbing as they run onto the main straight. It's got good straight line speed, though. The Porsche is actually able to pull away from the Aston as they go past the pits onto the brakes into the source corner. Nowhere near the apex again, Wide John Camathias. So this is where the Porsche could be a little bit of a sitting duck once they go through Eau Rouge and over the top at Radion. But he's pulled down a little bit of a gap and he's pulling away a little here. Let's watch them through and see whether or not this is the issue that we thought it was. Goes, takes the wide line. Better there, but watch the Aston Martin speed. He's closing, closing, closing. Not as quickly as he was last time, but he's going to go by again. Yeah, can't turn the corners. The Porsche got brilliant straight line speed versus the Aston. But here's the opportunity for the big Vantage. Uses the slipstream. Surely it's going to be a carbon copy manoeuvre from earlier on. Now keep it tight, Ross Gunn, because this is where the Porsche fights back again. Brilliant GT racing and balance of performance possibly being played out in front of our eyes. This time the Porsche cannot get up alongside the Aston into Bruxelles, and that's the place cemented. Same sort of time lost. Prima Racing's Louis Delatraz crossing the line now. A minute left on the clock, so this will be the last lap. It's confirmed on the top of our timing screen for the debut team Prima Racing and this time last year Louis Delatraz Dele was doing exactly the same, same thing for a brand new team to the ELMS on that occasion as well Team WRT 2.8 seconds at LMP3 under a second in GTE as they've still got to start their final lap so one more lap to go for the GTs there's about a lap and a half to go 
for the LMP3s, but it's going to be tight, you know, Graham, because yeah. the number nine car might yet lap the LMP3 leaders. It could be the saving of him. It's in the fastest uh, part of the track. It's going to be about the speed of the number nine car down the Mistral Straits. And the important thing here is that if Delatraz gets ahead of the battling duo in LMP3, that will lock in their positions the next time they cross the line. It is nip and tuck. And actually, the nine car hasn't gained as much ground as I thought down the Mistral Straits. Out. It is about when the number nine crosses the line and what happens, either in front or behind him. Not the 17, do it. I think the 17 may have passed him, you know. Quite possibly, the 17's already in front. Malta Jakobsen, although 13 is still displayed as the race leader. They're heading Thanks. into Virage du Pont now and about the stream across the Lorenzo Colombo, Louis Delatraz and Ferdinand Habsburg. Malta Jakobsen is now in the lead of LMP3, even though they've got another 5.7 kilometres to do. And here's the GT battle for the final lap, Graham Goodwin. Cracking, cracking stuff in every single class. Ben Viscal brings it home for a famous second place World Cup Pro Racing overall. It's 2.5 seconds clear of the Panis Racing Orica of Yoponuta. That's the overall podium. But it's all about the classes here. Malta Jakobsen romping away in LMP3. An amazing closing gap here. And here we go to the flag in GTE. They're together. Is there going to be an overlap? Is there room? There's not going to be quite enough. It's going to be Rinaldi Racing. Take the win. All three GTE cars together on the same part of the track with Duncan Cameron, you sent now under quite a bit of pressure from Cadai and Picariello. The number three United Autosports car in all the activities we've been through the highlights. There, Johnny made it back to the pits, had some repairs and done to the, the right rear and has now got Andrew Bentley in that car. So Jim McGuire's uh, nightmare afternoon is, 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 is put to an end for him. You can have to go and have a chat with him. Right on a Bentley, it's now running down in uh, 30 seconds. Not way to see you know, to that far down, but uh, we'll keep an eye on that. It'll come back up through the order, I'm sure, because we've got Andrew Bentley at the wheel a bit now. Did, no disrespect to Jim McGuire, I don't think he likes some of those conditions, but uh, that car will work its way back through. And of course, Andrew Bentley do a great stint in it now, as we predicted, it's going to be Bentley and then Duncan Tappy, Silver Driver, into at the end. So I'd still, still keep an eye on that uh, on that number. A number three Autosport, a nice Autosports car. On the brakes, a Porsche for second, gets it. Brilliant move. That was all set up at the Parabolica. All three cars in GTE totally together here. Duncan Cameron is the bronze, but he can get stuck in like the best of them. And Picariello, the silver. Nicky Cadai, the silver, bags himself second place. And now the next task is to get ahead of the green Ferrari of Duncan Cameron. Which won't be an easy task, but the uh, Porsche, again, we saw this yesterday didn't we, in, the, in the Le Mans Cup race, that was exactly the same thing, the Porsche and Ferrari battle, and the Porsche just seemed to be monstering uh, that car and the Ferrari, and it's, it looks like it's going to repeat itself, hit repeat itself a day later, but Duncan Cameron will do his utmost in the number 55 Spirit of Race car there. That car will be handed over to, I think, either probably Matt Griffin next, I'm not sure whether uh, Aaron Scott's in that second or third. I've just got a it'll, feeling it's, it's... It'll be Griff to the finish, it normally right, is. Okay, so it's Aaron's going to go into it next. Yeah. yeah. To his silver and gold teammates is now for the race lead. Yeah, Picariello picks it off. And I don't think Duncan Cameron needed to really... Ninth in GTE, Maxime Robin took over from Arnold Robin, his brother in the previous stop, Matteo Cressoni. Silver rated driver as Matteo Cairoli watches on and he will be at the wheel of this number 60 car in the closing stages. It's the 60 that led the championship, remember, coming here to Aragon and they would love to still be in the championship lead with half the season done. And amazingly, at the end of August, we're still an hour and 41 minutes away from the half-season point. Yeah, they've got a lot of work to do, though. Eight positions between them and the, the lead. Up the inside, it's a bit of a lunge there. Is that going to work? Not there, it's not. Aston Martin gets to the corner, gets to the apex. But big pressure now on the Aston Martin from a charging Matteo Cressoni. So looking for a way by... Maxime Robin getting more experience behind the wheel of a GT consistency basis is marginally faster than Arnold Robin. But this is an intriguing fight here because Cressoni has been racing GTE Ferraris for a number of years, now jumping across to the Porsche. Can he get the car stopped into the dipper at turns eight and nine, right over the curves through the second element there? Don't want to be doing that on too many occasions because you will draw the attention of the stewards. Matteo Cairoli nervously leaning back 
in his chair as he watches this battle. He'd much sooner be in the car and oh, in yes. full control than having to watch his teammate. Oh, big dive this time, and I think he saw much more, more or less let him go. It's a very aggressive run here from Matteo Grassoni. It is. But uh, I think he's trying to impose his will. He's managed to do it on the Aston Martin driver. So that didn't look on, I have to say, coming through turn 11, but clearly um, Cressoni was fully committed. Every time he gets a kind of lap to have a crack at this, past comes a P2 or P3 car and gets between the two again. Be frustrating for Ricard, it won't be the first or the 101st time this has happened. So it's a very different line through there, trying something different. That Ferrari is super quick, isn't it? I suppose he relaxes in the knowledge that if he's got to allow the LMP2 car through, then so has Matteo very shortly too. And uh, far better to not fight that, just sit off the racing line, allow the P2 car through as quickly as possible, and then gather momentum once more. And he's lost, I mean, from a neck point of view, he's lost no time no. at all to Matteo Cressoni in doing that. They're both going to be lapped by the WRT car, and sensibly, Leitz picks up a bit of a toe this time from Newman into the WRT car. Uh, Louis Delatraz, who took over from Yi Fei Ye at that uh, penultimate stop for the WRT crew. Yep, squeezed the outside, but there's a bit of a wiggle over the kerbs there. Will that give him a, just an opportunity? He lost a bit of momentum up the inside, becomes the outside. He's got it done. He's got it done. Beautiful move. Beautiful move from Ricard Leitz. Podium results was, as well. It was something ludicrous, like three or four count back points, wasn't it, before we could actually declare a, a, a championship winner. It was down to the number of fourth places each car had had. And Here's now to the outside, Ricard Leitz. Oh, oh, it's it's Laza now. It's oh, sorry, Laza. Felipe La Laza, yeah. Fernandez Laza taking charge of the 93 car. Is this an outlap? No, not quite. It's, uh, the it's an outlap for the 80 car. OK, so... Tire temperature might have dipped very slightly, but uh, presumably, therefore, Felipe Laza is saying this is my time to pounce because this is the best opportunity of taking the race lead. Miguel Molina is the new driver into the 80 car. He's, he's coping not, well. He's not going to be easy to pass. It's no. Miguel Molina. He... And I think visually, on the balance of performance, that Ferrari is down the straights so much better than the Porsche. The Porsche is good through the corners, and that's where Leitz was closing in on the 80 Ferrari. And as you can see in the background, just four and a half seconds back, Rahel Fry. And that, this is going to become a three-car battle very rapidly. Well, Molina driving deliberately defensively. Just wonder if he can make the break on the Porsche and then focus on the road in front. He should be able to inch away, but this is the part of the circuit now where, for me, that favours the Porsche and Felipe Fernandez Laza trying around the outside of the black and white Ferrari of Miguel Molina. Tire attempts on the Goodyear Eagle still coming in for the Ferrari, whereas the Porsche has had a couple of laps to already do that. And Leitz having got by previous driver in the 80. Uh, Matteo Cressoni, now the new drivers in both of these cars are going to have to replicate that and let's hope that Felipe Fernandez Laza was watching exactly what teammate Ricard Leitz did at turns three and four to finally crack. 26, 21 and 30 cars. Got very tight for Anders Fjord back in the braking area. He was attempting to move on Ryan Cullen and forced onto the grass into the braking area but just about got away with that. Now then, this is the race lead in GTE. How close do you want it? OK, we're five minutes in, uh, but um, one very heavy car, 30 kilos heavier than the one behind it. The 77 is carrying weight as well, we must remember that, but only 10 kilos for Christian Reed. Side by side for second place. Slightly better positioning, though, for Fabian Laverne. That means he can edge off uh, Egidio Perfetti, who was timed as in second place at the line. Well, that's now gone back to the Ferrari as they leave the chicane. So in that uh, class, Dempsey Proton Racing, they're coming a little bit of ballast. I think it's 10 kilos for them. Christian Reed leads the race. Uh, Egidio Perfetti drops back in behind Fabian Laverne for the moment at least. Uh, the Ferrari carrying 30 kilos. Bit of contact there, side to side. And Perfetti ducks out of that, takes the effectively joker lap through the second yes. chicane. Joins in with very little time lost. Fourth, by the way, behind this trio is the JMW Motorsport Ferrari of Wayne Lou, who really impressed me. Uh, getting out of there, double yellow at turn one. 
So actually, the, the second Kessel Ferrari wasn't involved in the initial incident, had to take to the curbing to get by, but 55 facing the wrong way briefly, Duncan Cameron, and also involved the other Ferrari, as we mentioned, JMW Motorsport, Wei Li. The new fastest lap of the race goes to the car in 39th position, as Giorgio <laughs> Sergiotto shows just how annoyed he is to be at the back of the race. Uh, no shortage of speed there for the Delara at this point. Uh, look up the inside from Perfetti on Laverne there, that didn't quite work. Well, it's stuck there until a decision can be made about uh, whether or not that car is able to be recovered back to the track or is out of the race. Let's wait and see. Also slotting by the GT leaders is the number 34 car of Kubisch Michowski starting that into Europel competition P2. With the team down to two drivers, of course, Kuba and Danny Gloss, with uh, Leo Roussel, as you say, just uh, hurt in that incident yesterday. Get well soon, Leo. Behind is this GTE battle. Giulio Perfetti is not letting Fabian Lavone get away. No, certainly not. And uh, as I say, the more that Giulio Perfetti uh, pesters the back of the Ferraris, the big oh, lockup lock from Schmihovski there into the second chicane. But I think this Ferrari is now really starting to struggle with the extra weight, with the extra tyre wear too. And Giulio Perfetti is a splendid bronze driver, getting more and more used to a GTE Porsche. As he's shown in the World Endurance Championship, they had a strong round at Paul Ricard as well in the opener for the ELMS. So this is uh, literally a car's length between the top two in GT. And what about Christian Reid recovering now from that spin at Ascari? He's five seconds back from the cool racing car, which is about pretty much five seconds back from this GT battle too. That's right there. If they fact the cool racing car right now behind the Gidea Perfetti. Yeah. So um, we'll soon be looking to get by this pair of cars. There you go, there's a cool racing car with a BHK car behind. Probably going to view it, Christian Reid, popping out of the Ascari chicane in a moment. And there yeah. he is. Yeah. So that's the distance, five seconds. Perfetti trying to line up Laverne again for an overtake. They've allowed the two faster prototypes through. And what's Laverne's exit like out of the Parabolica? Really good. Again, is, that's is a momentum as, corner. It where is. they struggle with these, this Watch extra the Porsche. 30 kilo. Watch yeah, the Porsche. It was a great exit there. He goes to the inside. Now dummies that to the outside. It's the less favourable line into this chicane there. Mm. Can he do it on pure top speed? It's certainly under braking. Ferrari braking hard, hard. Takes the uh, takes back the position. Neatly defended there. It's beautifully done by Gidea Perfetti, but uh, the Ferrari just had him in the, on the braking rather than straight line speed. Now this is where it doesn't have the acceleration though, 30 kilos more, it's all bolted into the passenger seat effectively. Uh, I didn't realise there were several positions that the team can actually choose, I think two or three. But it's a sitting duck here surely for the Porsche, no! Very good on the brakes again. He almost collected the Algar Pro car, I don't think Perfetti had seen the, uh, the Orica catching, catching, catching. Now Laverne is squeezing the Orica. He's going to be desperate to get that car through. That's the 25 car of John Fowl re recovering back up through the field. Into the Lesmos. Well, Christian Reid will be loving this because that gap's now starting to come down a little bit. Or is it? No, Christian Reid uh, nine seconds away. So what's happened on this lap for the 77? Because if anything, these two cars will be holding one another up. The incident that involved John Fowl in the first corner no further action and also the race start everybody was in the correct order when we got this thing underway at bang on midday but uh, it looked like contact for John Fowl however uh, nobody to blame for that incident and this little lot as we watch this enthralling battle for the lead in GTE the lead battle overall is just under 1.5 seconds now James Allen catching Alexander Coigneau through up the inside goes the 31 car of Taxon Kim. John Fowl, by the way, has made up two positions uh, since rejoining the back of the LMP2 trail. Here comes Perfetti again up the inside this Got time. Got the inside line. And this might be the telling move. This is far, far better now for the Norwegian than a lap ago. Just needs to break just a smidge later than the Ferrari and potentially block overtake it. And can it turn in? Well, it's not the ideal line. The Ferrari takes a very different route. But now as the Porsche accelerates out of the chicane, it's already edging away and we have a lead change in GTE.